I tell you the story of me leading up to this moment and how much I wanted to fucking die because I want you to know the extreme of how much I want to live now. In honor of Mental Health Awareness Month, this episode is made possible with the support of Spring Health. This is a really special moment right now, coming into a new era, and we're doing you for the second time of What's Underneath. There's something happening. So can you talk about what your style says about you? I dress for protection. When people see me, I want them to know that I come from a strong bloodline, and I want the right ones to feel comfortable enough to come up to me. Up until I had my accident, I felt so afraid everywhere I went. And I felt like I would walk around with, with no protection, just so bare. I am such a voluptuous, feminine, beautiful woman. And when I walk through the world, people are so vampiric and feel like they have access to my sexuality and my beauty. The more that life picked at me, the more that I was abused by men, the more that I was abused by white women, the more that I was abused by like my oppressive environments, the more I turned towards indigenous elders for guidance on how to protect my energy so that people didn't feel like they could demand access to me all the time. What would you say are like the primary like assumptions that people make about you based on just how you look? I feel like all the assumptions that people have of me are correct. People think that I'm look like an evil, crazy witch. Well, I am crazy because this world has driven me insane. Mm -hmm. You gay, I am gay. I've always had like a little bit of facial hair. I'm Latina and indigenous. I'm Puerto Rican, Mexican, Guatemalan, Choctaw. Like I have a mustache as a woman. And I remember as a little girl, these white girls would be like, you look like a dirty Mexican, shave your mustache, or you have thunder thighs. And it's like, bitch, now everyone's getting surgeries to have these thighs and booties. Negative body image, a negative body sense of self. That's colonizer mentality. My mom was bulimic and anorexic and she was a model and she bleached her hair blonde mm -hmm. and she got surgery and surgery and surgery and started acting different. I saw the girl in her die and the mimicking of other women start to take over her. When I had to trace my traumas all the way back to why I threw myself in front of a train, it went all the way back to my mom's father, my indigenous grandfather who was born on the reservation and he was one of the many children who were forced into reformation schools. He was physically abused, he was sexually abused, he was spiritually abused. Can you take us back to, what year is it that everything went down? It was 2015. 15. January of 2015, I was attacked and sexually assaulted at a New Year's Eve rave. The staff gaslit me and they locked me in the back office without any support person near me. After that, I had really bad anxiety and it was why I started going to therapy. The first session, they put me on medication. They diagnosed me as bipolar. And I didn't find out until I was laying in the hospital bed that none of the doctors spoke to each other. And they actually were harmful to like mix those things together. Yeah, yeah. Now that I do what I do, I could have given myself such easy advice, slow down the spiral, to do less. And everyone that I feel triggered by and all the situations I feel triggered by, take a rest from exposing myself to those triggers. I was getting the opposite advice to like, keep engaging. We want you to stay in your same schedule. While I was on medication, I found it harder and harder to hold on to my relationships. So then I couldn't access my support system. I felt like no one could help me. When I'm angry and anxiety ridden and frustrated and can't think of a creative solution, then I've lost access to my own self. And I feel like that's what medication did to me. I would have a bad day before, but I could like access myself and bounce back. When I go back to all of the toxic people that may be added to my suffering, I can't even point a finger at anyone. The only thing I can point my finger at is these fucking systems, this, these colonized systems and institutions that make us sick. 
I was angry. Part of me was walking as an empty vessel. Two days before it happened, my insurance had changed. I wanted to go to a therapist and the therapist is not there. So I walked in with security guards, with like guns strapped to them. Am I here for just a therapy appointment? Like, why am I here? I'm so confused. And so I was terrified walking into this healing environment. <laughs> and the security guards started to walk towards me to like tell me to calm the fuck down. And I started running as fast as I could, hid in someone's yard and I was sitting there and I was hysterically crying because I literally thought that they were gonna like lock me up. When I got home that night, the boyfriend that I was on a break with wanted to talk. And he broke up with me and said that he doesn't want anything to do with me ever again. And I walked to the subway and I threw myself in front of a train. I thought for sure that getting hit by a train coming on full speed and getting like run over by a metal object would kill me, but it didn't, which I'm glad. I don't remember the feeling of being physically hit by the train. I just like felt complete bliss and then like I feel like I died. I don't know the time frame between that moment and when they actually got me on a stretcher and I remember opening my eyes and the the two older Latino men that would always work the door at our grocery store in Brooklyn, I made eye contact with them and I saw the horror in their eyes when they saw me and as soon as I looked at their eyes, I, I knew to not look at my body. And then the next moment, I remember waking up in the hospital. They didn't know what I was on, and so they couldn't give me any pain medication. So I sat there with my arm and leg ripped off without anything for about six hours. I had a few friends show up. Nomi Ruiz, my friend Eva Sanjuho, and my friend Gabriel Magdaleno, my three angels. Everyone was afraid to come identify my body. They were so brave. They sat there and they, they held my hands, my hand, and Nomi sang to me. And like, to this day, like, oh, I love those two women so much because over the past five years, they have not left me. Energetically, they have stayed by my side. I tell you the story of me leading up to this moment and how much I wanted to fucking die because I want you to know the extreme of how much I want to live now. When I was in the trauma unit, they were like, okay, we're not gonna be able to save your leg. We're gonna have to cut it off. And they gave me a bunch of like ketamine and like some other medication and like zonked me out. When they zonked me out, I went into another world. I felt like all of these white hands, like almost like the labyrinth when she's like falling through and the hands catch her. All of a sudden I was being carried by like all of these hands. And I felt like this download that like I needed to be a healer. I don't know why. And so I just started like, downloading, downloading what I should eat. Uh, the first meal I put in my body was an organic juice. I'm no longer putting any poison in my body. And a month in, I weaned myself off of most of the medication while I was in there. And I was able to actually leave the hospital with very few medications needing to be taken for pain. As soon as I got released from the hospital, I knew to go to my own people. I knew to go to indigenous healers and I knew to go to women. They helped me not only see what my pain was, they helped show me where the roots were. And I don't think that Western medicine could have done that for me. So what has it been like your relationship with your body? I am very lucky to have I've had years in my life where I was considered fat. 
seen as like, there's something wrong with you. We received stares. And I had already gone through that training of accepting my body as a bigger bodied woman. So like losing my arm and leg, like I had already done that foundational work. You know, it's another silhouette to like play with. I fell in love with like ancestral healing and ancestral medicine so much and in such a deep way. And I fell in love with like discovering my own like magic and like how to channel that like, this was just like, that's just a way that my body is. This transition also forced me to step into my womanhood. Even though I was like, you know, in my mid twenties when this happened, like I still considered myself a girl. And I feel like that goes under the umbrella of like me growing up as a child with a mother who was emotionally abusive. I think that like, I always walked the, went about the world as like her daughter. And like this transition, this like death rebirth moment, I was able to like re be reborn as my own person. When do you feel the most beautiful? I feel the most beautiful when I'm dancing. Why? Because I just feel so free when I dance and I feel so powerful. And like, I was blessed with like a very feminine body. And when I move my body, I see women from throughout the centuries in my body. What's your favorite part of your body? My hair. I love my hair. It's an antenna. When I dance around, it creates like a bigger force field. It's protective. And how has it been like with your sexuality and dating with this new body? My first experience with the opposite sex after becoming an amputee was watching how much I was like, had to dodge being preyed on. I didn't know there's like an entire group of men that prey on disabled women. At first it was very scary because it was like, when I have sex with someone, I take off my leg and if I take off my leg and this person tries to hurt me, I can't run from them. <laughs> the more I nurtured my intuition, the more my fear kind of subsided. My own voice telling me this person's safe and this person isn't and me trusting that is stronger than like my fear of, oh, what could happen? Why in your body? Why in your skin? Why in your journey? Why is it a good place to be? My body, my space, my journey is a good place to be because there's no one else that can come with as much fire, with as much fury and vengeance and revenge for women, children in this earth like I can. I want to live more than anything now because it's like we have so much of the world on this wavelength of change. Mm -hmm. It's like there's so much momentum. It's like, how could you give up now? Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of What's Underneath, made possible with the support of Spring Health. Follow us along on Instagram at stylelikeyou and at spring.health for more details on how you can join in on our mental health awareness campaign. Please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel over here. And don't forget to ring the bell so that you're notified every time we release a new video on Thursdays. Lots of love.